webinar today, The Colorful, Colorful World of Black and White with Jim LaSala. I'd like to introduce Jim LaSala. Uh, Jim specializes in fine art photography, portraiture, and street documentary. Um, he has won several state, national, and international awards for his photography and has been featured in several publications such as Lenswork, PPA Magazine, and PDN. He's also a Moab master. Um, Moab has worked with Jim for many years to test and promote all of our papers. So thank you, Jim, for taking the time for us today. Um, and I'd like to pass it over to you to get started. Awesome. Hi, Paige. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining, uh, joining us today, um, either the afternoon or maybe morning for you guys, but we do appreciate it. Thank you, Paige, for having me. I'm very excited to be able to share some of my uh, insights in black and white photography, why I, why I love it, and hopefully I can inspire other people to uh, get out there and photograph some black and white. So what I'm going to do is we're going to start with a, <clears throat> excuse me, a keynote presentation, hopefully about 10 minutes, and then we're going to go into some post-processing. Um, you know, we have an hour to do this, so uh, sometimes it's a little a little more difficult to, to get all the nuances out, but I'll try to do my best and cover a lot of uh, information. So uh, let's get started. We're, we're going to go into uh, a keynote presentation. So, yes, yeah, so it's kind of an oxymoron, the colorful world of black and white. And the reason why I say that is because color has a lot to do with uh, actually getting your black and whites to look their best. Uh, for me, uh, one of the best ways to learn uh, photography is, is black and white because some of the reasons are there's no color distractions. Um, we, we understand how to see light and contrast. Um, it gives us the ability to push our creativity. So what really this is all about is learning to tell a story without the help of color. Sometimes it's not very easy to do that, but if you look hard enough, um, it, it, it is out there. Some examples. So uh, years ago, I never got into the dark room. <clears throat> Excuse me, I never got into the dark room, uh, but I always uh, was amazed about uh, how people could uh, do what they did in the dark room. Uh, I was fortunate enough to get in and start really understanding black and white when the digital photography came along. And um, so what's really nice, if you guys are shooting digital, and mo I, I'm imagining most of us are, we have instant gratification just by looking at the back of our camera, which is just so very wonderful. So, you know, people say, fill the, you know, fill the frame, get everything in the camera, you know, and which is very true. And it, it could be color or black or white. Uh, it, it stands true for both. But uh, one of the things I would tell you to do is, some people can get a great black and white from a JPEG and that's, that's wonderful, but you gotta understand there's so many different situations that it's hard to make a custom profile for just every, every type of shot. So I would urge you to make sure that you're shooting both in black and white and, and JPEG if you wanna see it. Uh, I shoot with my camera uh, on a black and white mode, but I am shooting uh, RAW as well. So when I get it back into the, um, to my computer, uh, I have all the color information. I'll be talking a lot about shapes and tones and things like that, because that's really kind of what makes black and white so special. Um, once again, we're trying to uh, lead our viewers into an image without you know, seeing a specific uh, dynamite color or something like that. We're really pushing them with, with uh, more tones and shapes and things like that. So look for these things when you're uh, planning your black and white shooting. Uh, look for the light. Of course, without it, we have nothing. So please uh, look at it, understand it, uh, be it flat, be it oblique, uh, whatever it might be. Just look for it and, and, work, and work with it. Ansel Adams was uh, the master of pre-visualization. Um, which is not an easy thing to do. But now that we have uh, uh, a Polaroid on the back of our, our cameras, we can actually see, and that's what we used to do years ago, we used to use Polaroids just to see what it might look like. Um, so now we can see it on the back of our cameras and it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Uh, mirrorless is what you see is what you get. So that really helps you uh, improve your photography. 
no, you know, flowers are something that we always think about as beautiful colors, and they are. And you know, this would probably work well just in in both genres, both in black and white and color as well. But uh, I, I I just love this because it's uh, the simplicity, uh, and I'm just looking at just beautiful uh, contrast and shapes, and nothing else is really interfering with that. A great time to go out and shoot uh, after the snow, during snow, inclement weather, all that stuff is really, really good. It actually uh, gives you a head start. You are looking at things that pretty much are uh, monochromatic, so it'll give you a, a good idea of uh, what the image is going to look like. Um, uh, adding some tone to your image it doesn't have to be black and white. There's so many different variations. Uh, this one has a little platinum. Uh, uh, tone to it so don't stop just that black and white you know we have sepias we got uh, all kinds of different colors blues uh yeah i mean there's there's no limit so uh you know don't just stop at uh just plain black and white <clears throat> excuse me beautiful sunset uh uh sunrise i'm sorry beautiful sunrise and of course we we look at blues and yellows and all these gorgeous colors and it is stunning and but we then we can make it a little more simplistic by just looking at the same product in, uh, and it's just beautiful dynamic forms. Uh, you can like either one of them. You may not like the black and white. I, for me, um, I do. Uh, but don't get me wrong. I I do some I do some color too. But my my passion is is the black and white. Early morning fog gives us the ability actually to see in monochromatic tones as well. So get out there and, and look for a situation like this, maybe early morning before the fog has burnt off. Yeah, I'm not a, a proponent of getting up too early. Uh, I like more sunsets because uh, I can sleep and it just uh, makes it a little easy for me. But uh, I think what I'm trying to get across here is, you know, don't leave home without it. Bring your camera with you all the time. I keep it in the car all the time. You never know what's going to pop up. And, you know, without us being there and capturing it, we have nothing to really, um, you know, relate to, the, to uh, the people that are viewing our images. So it's up to us to capture it and then for us to share it with everybody else. I'm a city kid. I live in Flemington, New Jersey, but I grew up in Brooklyn. I uh, love Manhattan, Philadelphia. Uh, so I look like a tourist when I'm walking around in the city. My head is up in the air like all the you know, tourists might be, but I'm always looking for dynamic uh, tensions and, uh, and shapes and contrast between the skies and the buildings. So it's out there. Don't be afraid just because it's an overcast day that it's not a good day to shoot. Very simple. Uh, and this is just a study in, in lines, in contrast, blacks and whites. Uh, look for this. And it's very simple. It, it's um, something, something that you have to take a double look. It's there, but sometimes it's just hard to see it. Um, look around, and sometimes you may have to just turn around 180 degrees, and it's behind you. So, you know, don't give up. Look around and, and keep your uh, options open. Here we have uh, some of the things that I look for. Uh, composition is very important uh, as, as well as the lighting. Uh, here we have a couple of elements. Uh, the composition is very strong. We have leading lines. We have these beautiful archways. And the last thing we have is contrast between the darkest part of the image and, and, the, and the lightest. So your eyes are forced to go right to this uh, young lady crossing a bridge. You can see I have a very low camera angle. I didn't want to show, show too much. So I'm really very low and capturing, uh, you know, a, a great story. Uh, somebody uh, crossing the bridge in Manhattan. Yeah, uh, sunny, sunny days. Some people don't want to go out and shoot on sunny days. Uh, the, the image on the right obviously is, is uh, is very dynamic and with, without the sun, it would be so flat, nothing to see. Uh, the one on the left is a mild, mild, um, uh, unique lighting. You can see how it beautifully lights the, uh, the text, uh, the, uh, 
up on the top and it's just, it's, it's much softer, but it still has direction of light. Once again, uh, sharp leading lines. I have a problem tilting my camera and, um, you know, I'm going for therapy. I should be okay in, in a little while, but I do like, I like the tension uh, of, of uh, turning my camera. Yeah, look for very oblique lighting, side lighting and stuff like that. That really will bring out the texture in, in your images, both, both color and black and white. Um, he, here you see uh, how, be how beautiful you can see the textures in the tree and uh, the tree branches along with this beautiful statue. I believe that was in, uh, in uh, Gettysburg. Okay, I think this is where a lot of people fall short. Uh, so we want to try to capture the full range in your camera, if you possibly can, um, from the deepest whites and uh, uh, from the uh, brightest whites to the deepest uh, shadows. And uh, sometimes we can't get it all in the camera. Uh, you know, you're shooting a white polar bear on a, in the snow. You're not going to get a full range on your histogram, but uh, get as much information as possible. And then we're going to go into the post -processing, processing end of this. So, like I said, I trust my histogram. Uh, this is a very sad histogram. You can see we're, we're losing details in the shadow and as well as the highlight. So, you know, if you can't get it in camera, like I said before, let's try to help it once we get into either Photoshop, camera roll, whatever, whatever your choice is. Let's bring in that, let's bring in the, and pop it and let's get those uh, contrasts moving and it, it, it makes for a much more dynamic, uh, dynamic image. So what are some of the things that I like about black and white? So there's quite a few. Uh, there's, it's a timeless way of looking at photography. It's, uh, it can be artistic. Can some of these things be classified with color? Of course they can, but these are just some of my preferences when I'm, when I'm looking at subjects for, uh, for black and white. And it is romantic. So, I'm taking, let's take a look at this image. It's really, it's a very powerful image of this young, young woman on the street. Um, I do a lot of street photography and um, it is powerful. But when, when you turn that into a black and white, we, I'm forcing the viewer to really go to her. Uh, although the rest of it is secondary, it's, uh, it's part of her story. Let's put it side by side. And we, we can see the difference. Uh, the first thing that I, I almost see in the color one is, is, the, is the red mattress, because you know we're, we're, we're looking at bold colors and stuff like that. And when I look at the black and white, what I see really is I go right to the center and, and I'm looking at this, uh, this unfortunate uh, young woman. What's really nice about <clears throat> photographing people, uh, we tend to have a lot of red, uh, yellows and oranges in our skin. So black and white is a perfect uh, uh, genre to capture uh, models. Skin tones become very, very beautiful. It almost does, uh, does an instant um, retouching for you. So um, a wonderful tool to photograph uh, models and people. It's autistic. Look for some different crazy things. Uh, I photographed this model on the right and uh, it, it, it has a nice contrast between uh, darks and lights. I didn't go too crazy about it because uh, I didn't want I didn't want too much contrast on her face. She's got a beautiful beautiful skin, so I want to kind of blend the combination in. I've been to Cuba many times. Uh, I should, many times Haiti. I've been to many times Cuba. I, I was there once. It's a wonderful place to visit, and oh my gosh, uh, it screams uh, lots of black and white. Although I came back with some some cool colors as well. Just another example. Uh, this image is uh, 30 years old. You know, this I shot in Coney Island many, many years ago. But when you look at that story, it's still, you know what, it could be any time, it could be today, it could be, you know, 30, 40 years ago. That's what I really like about it. <clears throat> Excuse me, it's simplistic. We have nice leading lines. It's a very, it's a good storytelling image. And these are some of the things you want to look for uh, when you're photographing something, not just, you know, sh uh, pressure shut up, but let's think about what you're exactly, what you're trying to capture. 
some white uh, images in the city. One is Manhattan, the middle one is Philadelphia, as well as the one on the left. I'd like to take a quick story on the one on the right. This young model was in, on Sixth Avenue in Manhattan. And I sometimes I do crazy stuff and I actually chased it down because I wanted to photograph her. I thought she was unique. And I stopped her and I asked her if I could photograph her. Um, uh, and the way she looked, I figured, uh, I guess you're going to work. And what she responded to me was, no, no, I'm going to the movies. She opened up a pocketbook and you can see a, a bag of popcorn. So these are the great stories that you could, you could find as you're um, dealing with people. I love to interact with people and find a little bit more about them. Timing, of course, in, in, in black and white, in color is, is so very important. Look for them, try to capture the moment um, that'll tell a, tell a story. Abstracts, they're great. Doesn't have to be people, it doesn't have to be buildings, architects, it could be some crazy stuff. I don't know, it's, it's just me. The one on the left is a, is a stone wall and it really reminded me of uh, Jesus. You can almost see the thorns in his, in, in his headdress as well as the face. So that's just my take on it. Everybody has a different, a different opinion or a different look. Um, okay, maybe some of you don't know what this is. It's called a typewriter. And uh, it's uh, something that we had way before our computers. It was crazy what we had to do, but uh, it uh, got us through. And uh, now we've moved on to a new dimension. So after you capture your image, what are we doing? So for me, I go into Lightroom uh, and I'm gonna explain a little bit more when I get in there, what I do in Lightroom. And of course, if you don't have Lightroom, you can use uh, Camera Raw, which is uh, really the same engine. So both of them are just as fine. Some of the things I'm gonna do, most of the things I do in Lightroom is really, uh, I process the exposure. I do some color correction. I know it sounds weird, but once again, like I said before, you really need the proper um, colors to get a good black and white. You wanna be able to start off with something that uh, will give the uh, ability to use some of these filters in black and white that will affect the, the colors. So um, uh, that, that's one of the things I do. Plugins, there's lots of them out there. Do you need them? We're gonna talk about that in a second. Uh, Exposure is, is a wonderful program, as well as Nick, uh, the Nick Collection, and Topaz as well. So let me give you some examples of what doesn't work really well is this grayscale. But what grayscale really is doing is just desaturating your image and it's not giving you much more uh, uh, advantage of uh, taking it to another level. Photoshop has adjustment layers, which is, which is decent actually. <clears throat> um, so it has a black and white adjustment layer along with the filters that uh, color filters that you can adjust and that is not bad. And then of course the best would be these plugins and I'll explain to you why. Um, grayscale conversion, this is just flat out grayscale conversion and then something in, in exposure. There was some work done in exposure but I had the ability to do that. Same, same thing here, we have um, some waves coming through and here we're able to make it a little more uh, dynamic. Do you have to go out there and uh, like buy all these programs? Well, I, I don't know. For me, I do. And the reason why is because, <clears throat> because its workflow is, is much, much faster a lot more presets, although you can get presets for Lightroom, but I, I find that the presets in, in these plugins work better for me. The algorithms are much, much better. Um, we have tons of filters, uh, edges. If you want to put edges on your images, you can tone them, vignettes, and that's all some of the things that I love about plugins. So let's figure out what works best for, for everybody. So we're gonna go into post-processing with use color to your advantage to uh, bring out some beautiful black and whites. Well, the last thing I wanna talk about really is the print. You guys got all your images. Well, I shouldn't say everybody, but there's a lot of people that unfortunately keep it on their phones, on their computers, and they're not sharing it. It's not the, it's not the best way. I mean, it's, it's great. You can send uh, your, you know, your iPhone images to, to, to your parents and grandma, you know, grandkids and all that. And it's a wonderful way to share. But um, it's not the final product. You really, uh, I would 
urge you guys to get into some type of printing, get it out. You can feel it. You can, you know, you can see it has, it's tangible and it's, it's really a beautiful uh, a way to finalize your, uh, your images. Moab, thank you guys, uh, both Paige and uh, Mark Shotland. Uh, these guys continue to put on these uh, educational webinars that are uh, phenomenal and I thank them very much. Just a quick shot of me, when I talk about prints, you can go from small to life-size and, and beyond. So don't be afraid, get out there and, and, pr and print your images. Okay, so. And Jim, before you get started in um, yes. Lightroom and Photoshop, uh, you had two questions about why you would shoot in black and white um, instead of putting your image into Photoshop and then converting. Okay, so uh, if I if I shoot just in black and white, the uh, first of all, you have to shoot that in JPEG. You can't shoot it in RAW because you can shoot in color in a color mode in raw, but it's still color when you get it back. I just use it to see the black and white on the back. If you shoot it in JPEG, black and white, the camera's gonna do all the processing. You can make custom, you can make a custom uh, black and white if you like to, um, which can gift you a really nice black and white. But then when you change uh, subjects, you're gonna start all over again. You're gonna have to, you know, maybe again, do another custom black and white. So. Uh, that is the reason why uh, you're stuck. Once you get that black and white back into, into Lightroom or Photoshop, you have no way of dialing in those color filters because you already have a black and white. So that is the reason. Okay, I hope that answered the question. Yep. All right, let's go into, uh, let's go into Lightroom. Some fun. What I'm going to do is show you a couple of images. This one here is the original. Uh, it goes way beyond all the things that I that I preach. I like to get in the camera as far as exposure. This was very quick, as you can see. My camera is crooked, a lot of backlighting, so I didn't get it all, but it's okay. I, I I just love the image. I saw him across the street. I tried to set up an exposure before I got there because I knew it was going to be quick. This is done in this is done in Lightroom. It's a lot of work. Um, you know, this itself, uh, just to show you why it's a lot of work, is I'm going to take this into a develop module. And here, what has happened is they have these brushes. Uh, you can see I'm going to open this uh, maskings. And here you can add different types of brushes. You can go with a brush. You can go with a linear. A gradient, you can go with a radial gradient. So as I move my cursor on these masks, you can see uh, by the red uh, overlays where I'm actually putting all these things. That's part of the sky. Um, we're gonna come back here and I'm just gonna go a little further down and show you some of these. This is just right on his knee. So these are all different masks that I apply just to add lighting or shadow to it. It's kind of tedious. You can do it also with a brush. So that's all fine and good. Um, so my preference is to fix it, my exposure, and, and all the little, maybe slight little details and get into Photoshop because it's much quicker for me. And let, let me just go into the original and I'm going to do something very, very quick. So this is my original. One of the first things you would want to do is get in here. <coughs> and uh, the first thing is, color, is lens correction. Uh, make sure that you have your uh, chromatic aberration. Although we're going to black and white, it's not going to make much difference. But if you're doing color, you should still do this on all of them. Enable the, uh, uh, your profile. My profile is built in, so if you're not seeing anything. If you don't have a built-in profile, it's going to uh, take away the, uh, the dark corners around your image and, and make it in, you know, and make it much clearer. So please use that. The next thing on this particular image, I'm going to go to transform and I'm going to try to straighten it out a little bit. So I'm going to go to auto. That did straighten it out. You can see this white here. So just come down here and say constrained crop. And if you think it's still a little crooked and you want to crop it, you just go into your crop tool. 
and you can tilt it if you want. I'm just going to straighten it out just a little bit. Whoops. I'm going to straighten it out just a wee bit there. And I'm, I'm actually going to bring it in from the bottom. I'm going to keep the pole on the right and I'm, I'm going to come up. Whoops. I'm going to come up on the top as well. Okay. So I'm pretty happy with that. I hit return and I'm in there. The next thing I would do with this is I go into my basic and my first problem is really is the shadow. So I'm going to come in here and just open up the shadows. I'm going to bring down my highlights. I'm checking my, if you hold on your option key or old key and you hit the blacks, you can actually set your black tones by dragging it to the left. Whoops. So if I go all the way to the, if I go all the way to, to the left, you can see those, that's what's going to be clipping. So we don't obviously don't want to go that far. So having black in your image is okay. I mean, there's nothing wrong with that. Same thing with the white. I'm going to go to the right and you can see where it's starting to blow out. So I'm just going to come back just a wee bit. So right now I kind of set my white and black points. You can see my histogram is pretty well. Uh, you, you remember before it wasn't the best histogram. Here you can, you can go into a, a linear gradient. I'm going to just do the top. You can see the red overlay and that's where it's going to, it's going to help bring down some of the highlights. I go very bright and then I go uh, back down in. I'm going to bring down the whites a little bit just to give it some flavor. And I'm probably going to do the same thing. I'm going to add another one to the bottom just to add a little, a little vignette in there. So here we go. And I'm just going to bring down the shadows just a little bit. As you can see, I'm creating uh, somewhat of uh, a vignette. So let's just say I'm kind of happy with this. I'm, I am not going to go, well, let me just do one so you can see what I'm talking about. So if I wanted to go in here with a brush, you can start, you can start brushing here. Once you've got that brush, you can raise the exposure. As you can see here, I'm going to go to the extreme. But I, you know what? I, I really don't want to, I'm not going to do that because it's really time consuming. But what I want to do is go into the black and whites of this. So let's go down. Uh, the, I'm sorry, let's go to the basic. Let's get out of that. We're gonna go black and white, which is in your basics. And from here, you can go into your colors. Black and white. And here we have, not, you can see the red on his hand. Let's go to the orange. Same thing. Like I said before, there's a lot of oranges and yellows in the, uh, in the skin. Let's go to the blue. I'm able to bring, well, you can see his, his dungarees have a lot of blue as well as his sweatshirt and, and the sky. So you can go somewhere in between there, which is fine. Um, let's check out the yellows. And you can see what it does to the steps. So these are some of the ways you can start building up your uh, contrast. Uh, you can then go to your tones, your, which is like your curves. I would probably go from a linear, maybe to a medium. And you can see that brings it down. Now we can take a look at our histogram again. And maybe we want to go back to the basics. I would probably raise the whites just a little bit. This is for contrast. And then I would bring down my blacks a little bit more, just about in, in there. So here we have something that I did without really doing too much retouching, like I said I did in, in here. And let's go to this one here. Here I did a lot more with the, with the radials, linears, and stuff like that. So let's start again and bring it into Photoshop. So I'm gonna go back to the original. I'm gonna reset it and show you what I, actually, what I would actually do if I went into a third party plugin. So uh, once again, we're gonna go down to your lens correction. I'm gonna just take care of that. I'm gonna go down to my transform once again, auto. 
I'm going to get, uh, I'm going to constrain it, get my crop tool, make sure I'm straight. I'm looking at my, the steps, just a wee bit, come up here. You know what? I'm going to come up to the top of that step. I'm happy with that. And then I'm also going to uh, get my basics. I'm definitely going to pull out my shadows now because I need that for a start. I'm going to pull back my highlights. So this is just really just exposure we're working on right now. Look at my whites. Once again, make sure it's where I want it to be. Pull out my blacks. And we're good. So this is how I would start before I go out to Photoshop. Now I'm going to export it out to Photoshop. Close down uh, Lightroom. And while you do this, I'm going to ask some questions that we have. Sure. Um, Go ahead. Is it a is a better histogram as simple as exposure? A better well, there are many. I, I do trust my histogram. I I really do. When you're shooting, look at the back of your camera. Make sure your histogram is present, and and trust it because it will give you a better idea of where you might be clipping or it gives you a better idea of maybe your exposure needs to come up. Um, so I do rely on my histogram very, very much. So please try, uh, some, some photographers don't, don't look at it. That is, that is my Bible when it comes to uh, working on uh, images. I, I do look at my histogram. So please uh, get used to it, understand it. So and if you had to choose between exposure and is it Nick Silver Pro, which would you prefer? Um, I like I like both exposure. Um, you know what? They, they're both amazing. And I'm going to try to touch on both of them right now. So uh, um, this one, I'm going to do exposure. And one of the first things I'm going to do is filter, obviously. What's nice about exposure also, it's going to put it on a separate layer, which helps. And I'm not going into black and white. I'm going to go into color because I want to continue to work on this image and bring in some more color. So, so I'm going to try to build up some, some contrast and maybe some saturation. I'm not too sure. Let's take a look at. Uh, uh, I'm going to take a look at Riala just, just for, uh, for this particular demonstration. One of the things about you have to be careful with um, using uh, presets. Sometimes they put in stuff you don't want. One of the things I always look for is make sure that my the gr it didn't add any grain, and this one did. This particular preset adds a grain, so I don't I I don't want a grain, so I'm just going to take it and shut it off. I'm also going to go back into my basics. I'm looking at my histogram, and it looks like it can add a little more contrast to this. I can add a little more, a little more uh, highlight, just a wee bit, and I'm going to bring down my blacks a wee bit. So I'm going to apply that, and once that is done, it's a big file, so I wanted to get some good resolution. So I'm just going to come in closer, and you can see. So here's uh, before and after. There's a lot of things we can do here. We can use a layer mask, okay? And this is what I would do. And start taking away from areas that you think it doesn't benefit. So, you know, you may, uh, you may wanna open up some of the shadows here, which is okay. You may wanna make sure that your, your sky didn't go too white. So you can, you can bring back some of that sky. I'm using a black brush on a white, um, a layer mask. And you can also, you know, at this point, you can start building up some of the highlights and shadows. I'm going to do it a little bit better later, but I just made that darker and I don't want to do it. So I'm fine with that right now. I'm going to accept it. I'm going to just take a little more of the shadow out of here, open up that a little bit too. So let's, what I'm going to do now is just to make it a little faster, I'm going to repeat the same. Built up by hit, hitting Command F, 
you know, I might I might go back in there and, and use a different uh, color, but just for uh, time's sake, I'm going to go in here and hit it again. And you're going to see it's going to have a dramatic effect right there. So right now, what I'm going to do is really take away everything that's there, go in with a, a white brush. By the way, I inverted my mask to take away all that craziness. And here, you know, you can start actually building up these beautiful lights that will lead us into the image. As you can see here, you can build up the mask, his face. All these things that I want you to look at is where I'm going to start painting in some of these things, okay? I'm going to take a look at, I'm just going to bring in some more here and, and here as well. I'm going to take a look at my histogram, see where we are. Histogram looks really good. As you can see it, I haven't, I'm not clipping. I'm in good shape. All right, let's go into black and white. So right now, go back to exposure, black and white. Let's reset this back to where it is and let's go into black and white. I'm gonna probably go with something very, uh, you know, not, not too crazy, something that has just a nice feel to it, not overdone. I'm just gonna go with this Agfa. I'm looking at my histogram, it looks good. I don't want no grain. Maybe you do, if you do, leave it on. Okay, here we have our black and white. The next thing we're going to start working on is dodging and burning. A lot of people have different ways of doing it. Um, one of the ways that I do it is by using curves. Some people like to use a dodge and burn. I'm not too crazy about that. So let's open up the curves. Uh, as a matter of fact, let's do an uh, adjustment layer curves. And I, I'm going to change this to screen. And you can see it's pretty light. So I'm going to invert the mask, Command or Control I. And now I can go into brush and I can start dodging in some areas that I want to dodge in. So we can start painting here, build up this area here, just like this. Same here. And this is just an easy way. And you can see it's much, it's much easier for me to control, build up his hand, come back in here. And you may want to back up a little bit. And let's, let's actually add some, some highlights here. By the way, um, if you want to hit add a highlight that's straight, click on one end and hold the shift key and it'll actually go horizontally just just across which is kind of cool so if that's something you want to do come in here do some painting once again this is where i want people to go a little more on the top you can come down in here and just highlight and then we're going to do just i'm going to open this up a little bit more then we can do the opposite of that we can add another curves adjustment layer this time what we're gonna do is we're gonna go into multiply and we're gonna invert that layer. And here, let's just come in a little closer. Here we can start darkening things down. I'm at 30% and we can just start coming on. Let me go to 40. So we can start making things a little bit darker in some areas. Again, just, just like you would in a dark room, come in here and start darkening things out, you can do it in the sky, do it down in this area here. And I, I, our object again is almost to make a little vignette come in here. I'm gonna back it up a little bit. Get out of there, oops. And here, um, we went from that to that. Some of the other things why I like about, um, oops, why I like about doing plugins is I can go back into exposure. And here we have many different things you can do. You can actually come in here if you want to do a vignette. I'm going to turn off the uh, grain again. I'm going to do a vignette. What's really nice about uh, this vignette is uh, let's just pull this up. 
they have a vignette location. So as you can see, it moves around to wherever you want to put it, which is really kind of nice. I, I decided to make the lighting come more from the, from the right-hand side, just like that. And, um, and then from there, you know, do your softness how round, and then of course, how bright. I'm just gonna come down here just, just a very, very little bit. And so you have a small, you got a light, you got a light thing yet there. And, and the last thing um, you could do if uh, you saved it in say a JPEG or something like that, and you wanted to put it up online. One of the last things you can do is go back and let's put a, let's put some kind of, you know, border on it, which is uh, just another nice way to, to finalize it. So they have all kinds of different overlays. Uh, here's borders. You can go from uh, grungy, plain uh, uh, print borders. Oh, let me show you this. This is cool. So I'm going to I'm going to go to a print border that has a color on it. So let's just say uh, I go with this one. And you you might like it, but you say, but yeah, it's in color and it really is not what I wanted to do. So what you can do is accept it. It's yellow. Just turn it from normal to luminosity, and then you're back into your black and white. Um, so that that really helps very, very much. Um, hopefully, I know it was quick, and I, I try to do uh, try to cover the different steps as quickly as I could. Um, what I want to do now is just take you straight uh, to another image, and uh, let, let's go use, uh, let's use uh, uh, Nick, Nick this time, Silver Effects. Any questions on this uh, page? Yes. Um, when you took your image into Photoshop from Lightroom, you did uh, an export as opposed to an edit in Photoshop. What's the difference and why do you do it one way or the other? That's a great, that's a great question. Um, I'm on a laptop right now, so it, it doesn't mean that much to me, but on my, my, my big computer, when you're talking about uh, thousands of images, Everything in my Lightroom catalog is just my raw files. I don't bring in any of my working files in there because otherwise I would have obviously double. Now I got 100,000 files. So now I'd have 200,000 files. So all my working files go on a separate catalog, uh, a separate hard drive that I call my working file. And that's done in chronological order. So that's really a good question. I try to keep everything lean so things will go faster. Good question. Um, also, what printer do you use and what is your favorite paper for black and white and both color? You expect me to say Moab? Yeah, I'll say I Moab. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> um, I use a P800. I, I also had a 90, a 9900. Unfortunately, it, it, uh, it went to the uh, graveyard, but uh, I'm looking to maybe move up to a 24, but I do, I do use Epson, I use Epson. So I do use a P800, which is wonderful uh, printer. Um, you know, you can go, you know, go, goes up to uh, seven, uh, you know, 17 inches, which is fine for me right now. Um, so, uh, two of my favorite papers since um, uh, I'm not looking, uh, although I do sometimes some specialty papers and Moab has some crazy papers, some rice, rice papers, which is wonderful. Um, but uh, for my black and whites, for the most part, I use uh, Entrada. I, they make a couple of different Entradas. I make a natural and a bright. And then I, I will um, uh, use the 300, which is a heavier paper. And if you look for something a little more photo, photographic, like an RC paper, they have the Juniper paper, which is just phenomenal. Um, it has a slight texture to it, like you would see when you ordered, if you used to uh, order from your lab. Uh, the, the black tones are tremendous, very, very deep blacks and, and um, amazing whites. So uh, those are the, my two favorites. I, you know, I dabble in some other stuff. They have a Somerset paper that is uh, uh, these rag papers that are wonderful. By the way, the, uh, uh, the Juniper is a, a Barada type paper and it's, it has a beautiful feel to it, weight to it. It is, it is really, it's awesome. Great. Okay. All right, I'm going back into Lightroom. I'm, I'm going to work like a crazy man. All right, so, oh, by the way, this is why I use Lightroom. Um, I got 10 minutes. Can I, uh, do I have a little time, uh, Paige? 
Yeah, go for it. And then we'll answer um, the rest of the questions. Okay. Uh, this is the reason why I use Lightroom, right here where my pointer is. It's a wonderful place to uh, fix your exposures, but this, this uh, particular application is a data management program and it is the best. And that's why I use it. This catalog only has about uh, uh, 2000 images. Let me take a look. Uh, two, about 2000 images. So this is why I use it. So let's say I just go to go, uh, go to all my images. All right. And then I go to my text and I want to find a picture. Let me say my uh, water tower. That's how fast it found my water towers, whatever was in my catalog. That is why I use Lightroom for, uh, for, for this powerful purpose, okay? So uh, let me get rid of this, go back. Let's, let me go back to uh, the presentation. And let's go to this guy. I'm gonna do this really, really quick. Uh, D for development. Once again, I'm going to uh, you know, do my lens correction, blah, blah, blah. Then I'm gonna go into uh, my transform, see if there's anything happening there. And if did, it straighten it out a little bit, as you can see. I'm gonna crop it a little bit. There's some things on the side I really don't wanna see, something like that. Um, I, I love the leading lines and that's the reason why I'm, I'm using this. Just come up a little bit, hit okay. I'm gonna go into my basics, basics again, bring my, my uh, highlights down. Bring my shadows up. I have a lot of shadow, but I still want to make sure that I, that I got it all. Because once I bring my shadow up, I'm going to bring my blacks down. You can see what happens. The first part that comes black is the window on the top. That's okay. It should be black in your images, and there should be white, uh, white in your images. Um, the whites, I'm just going to come down just a little bit for the sky. And you know what? I'll add very quickly a bottom vignette, <coughs> oops, uh, millennia, just come in here. I'm holding the, uh, I'm holding the shift key so it's nice and straight, if that's what you need. I'm gonna bring down the shadows a little bit. And if you want one last time, I'll see if I can bring back a little more of the highlights and whites and highlights, just so we have a nice sky and that's it. Now I'm going to go to my export. And once again, I'm not going straight into uh, my black and whites. I still want to pop this a little bit. And I'm going to do that uh, because uh, silver effects is just black and white. Although you can, you can actually make black and white in your in uh, silver effects and turn and change your mode into luminosity and you're back in color. So you can do it in both programs. I'm just gonna do it in this one here because it's gonna save us a little time. And I'm gonna reset it, go to color and let's go something a little, uh, little funky. Let's go into, I don't know, slides. Let's see what we got here. Uh, um, yeah, we got, let's go into this Fuji uh, 50 and uh, shut off my uh, grain and hit okay. Okay, so once I, once I have that, this time let's go into, I'm gonna save this just in case we have any trouble. Uh, Silver effects has had some bugs in it, so I don't wanna go hopefully have any problems with it. They just updated it, so let's hope that works. So Silver Effects is an awesome program. It has, just like any other plugins, it has presets in here. Presets are just the way to get started. It doesn't mean you have to you know, use them. It's just a, a, a way. Here they have all kinds of uh, uh, classics. Uh, they got different, as you can see, all kinds of cool stuff, vintage. And of course, you, you can make uh, you can save your own. So once you have one that you like, these are all mine that I can save. Uh, I'm just going to go, since you don't, you may not have any save ones. I'm just going to go down in here and look at, as, as you can see, as I move down, there's all kinds of different contrasts. There's brights, there's uh, a tonal protection. Once again, here's your color filters. 
Um, it has all cool stuff. So what I'm going to do here is just go into my, where are you? Uh, my general, uh, I'm going to go into film types, which is kind of nice. So I'm going to click here and you can, you can just scroll through some of these things and it gives you some really great stuff. I'm going to go with this uh, Panatom uh, Atomic uh, 32. I, I really kind of like it. Uh, once again, let's go back up here. I'm looking at my histogram. It looks pretty good. I look like I'm clipping a little bit, but you know what? It's probably down in these little areas here. It doesn't really bother me. Uh, one thing really nice about uh, this program is it's, it's got control points. So let's just say you hit a control point here. You can then, at that point, just target that, that area by itself, as you can see, which, which is really nice. Uh, so somewhat similar to Lightroom. Um, but I think a little more intuitive. Um, uh, I want to get uh, rid of that. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to add, I'm going to come back in here, make sure my, my shadows are protected. Just going to pull that back a little bit. My highlights are protected. And I'm just going to add a little contrast to this soft contrast, just to give it a little more pop. Just about there. I'm going to apply it. And what I want to tell you about color and black and white, this would probably be a good way of explaining it. Let's get back into Photoshop. Good. So if I change this to color, look at the difference between the color we had and the color we got from the black and white. So this is exactly what I would do. So right now I just change it to luminosity. It built up even more uh, contrast and, and saturation. So one more time, let's go back into silver. Oh, let me save this. Let's go back to silver effects. It is a process. And I'm going to lastly, before we get finished, I want to show you uh, a black and white with all the real processing and, and, and selections on it. So here, you know what, I, I think I'm just going to, you can see what happened here. We lost some whites and that's okay. So we're going to go bring out some highlights just a wee bit i'm going to add one more time just a little contrast uh, let me move this over just a wee bit and and just a little fine structure just to give it a little punch once again now that we're back I'm going to go into the dodging and burning like we did before. Uh, curves. Um, screen. Inverse my mask. Take my brush. White. I'm at 40%. Let's just start at 30. I'm going to come in here and start to show direction. You know, and this is this is what I mean, the color, black and white, it doesn't really make a difference. But I want to show direction. I want to keep the eye, the viewer's eyes into the areas that I want to go to. Um, so I would probably come back here. We know the light's coming kind of from behind there. Let's paint a little bit in there. Same back here. Let's just paint some, some here. Let's go in here and paint these windows. Let me come, uh, let's see if I can come a little closer. Let's paint some of these whites because that's what builds up this contrast. <clears throat> Down in here, let's build up some whites. I'm gonna back up a wee bit. And you may wanna just come in here and, and dabble a little bit. I'm gonna come a little bit higher. And just continue to play a little bit on the grass. Perfect. You may wanna come in here and just paint in there. Once I got that, we're gonna do one more time. <clears throat> we're gonna go into uh, multiply. And here we can build up once again, just our blacks. I come in here, just start tapping in our black areas, like here, here, uh, some of the shadow areas. You may wanna build your vignette just like this, same in, the, same in the area here. Just, this is really just painting. Painting with light, that's all it is. Uh, you may want to do some of the sky. I'm going to just come up in here and see if we can bring some texture back into some of the leaves. And sometimes we can, and you can see it did build up a little bit there.
And once again, let me just come a little bit closer. I would come in here, maybe do a brightness contrast, and which is right here. I build up some, some uh, basic highlights, and then I really churn up the contrast. And then again, I would invert it, and I would come back and pick up some areas that I really, I really want to highlight. Uh, again, some of these whites, some more contrast here, some contrast on the windows, and voila. Let me, let me go back. Let me take this here. And here you have just, and this was so fast, and I wish I, wish I could spend more time, but this gives you a general idea of the process that I go through. Um, uh, and before uh, any questions, I just, uh, yeah, why not? Uh, before any questions, I just want to show you one more thing that it's not an easy thing to, to get a, a really heavy duty black and white. So I'm going to open up uh, this guy here. And just show you, here's the black. Here's the black and here's the black and white of it. But what I want to show you is, if I go into my channels, you can see here. Let me move this over a little bit. I'm trying to get it so it won't move all the way over. It's just, I got all my channels. I'm trying to move it over if I can. Oh, let's move the channels out then. You can see here, all these are selections. So here, every you can see my selections right there. So it's, this is really what makes for a perfect black or white. You got to get different areas and, and work on those areas. So let me go back to RGB and turn off this one here. So un, under um, selection or select load selections, this is where I have all my channels selected. So if I want to select the sky, I hit that, hit OK. And here you see my sky is selected. And just to show you uh, what I mean, I'm going to just put that on its own layer. Uh, let me see, put this on its own layer and then bring up curves. And you can see it just Telling the sky. That's what makes for a very powerful uh, black and white. So it may look easy, but it takes a lot of time if you really want to get uh, a precise black and white. I hope I hope that helps you as well. All right. Any quick? Wow! Look at that. One o'clock. And we have lots of questions, so I'm going to try okay. to go through these quickly. Hopefully, it's not too technical. Don't ask me why the sky is blue. <laughs> I Go. think some might some might be technical, but we'll we'll all right. I'll, I'll, I'll get to them. All right, no um, no one, no inverse square laws. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, is Topaz black and white effects a separate Topaz product? Do, do you know that? Uh, it, um, you can buy separate products, and of course they have a bundle. You know what? I being sponsored by Topaz. I hate to say this. Um, I don't use it as much because there is too much. There's too many plugins and, and there's too many steps for me to, to get to where I want to go. And it seems to be a little bit slower, uh, but you can get tremendous black and whites. There's no, no doubt about it. You just gotta, you just gotta have to work on it. And do you ever take multiple exposed images and merge to HDR Pro 32 to maintain 32 bit grayscale during your raw edits? Uh, I do some, uh, I'm not a big HDR fan. I used to be, I try to get away from it now because we have, we have so many different uh, options now. Um, if I do an HDR or multiple exposures, it's probably only three. I'll take the, my, uh, my, my mid shot. I'll take something to make sure my highlight is good and, and that my shadows are good. So in other words, some people really go, you know, 10 exposures. But for the most part, I, I, 
depending on the lighting situation, if it's overcast, I don't really have too much of a problem. When you start getting into, uh, especially landscapes, um, these are some of the things you have to look at. I, I don't use uh, ND filters. I try to do everything in post. And I'm, I'm pretty successful in doing it in post. There's a, lot, there's a lot of things you can do. Do you have any pointers for printer settings for black and white? And do you print directly from Lightroom or Photoshop or use another app? I, I print, uh, uh, I would, the suggestion I would give you is uh, make sure, well, first of all, I print from uh, Photoshop. Um, make sure that you're using the right ICC profiles. You wanna make sure that Photoshop is, is controlling your color. You don't want your printer to do that because you, uh, that's the biggest problem people are having that it's not matching their, their uh, screen. Uh, if you go on to uh, Moab has all the ICC profiles there uh, for every paper, it also will explain to you what media setting to use. And that's very important as well. The media setting is going to, is going to tell you how much ink is going to, is telling the printer how much ink is going to be laid down for that particular uh, paper. So make sure that you, you use them. Th those um, profiles go into the color sync profile in your library. And that was someone else's question is, do you use the Moab profiles or do you use your own? I do. I, I actually can make my own profiles, uh, uh, custom profiles. Right now, uh, the ones that Moab provide are, uh, are phenomenal. So I don't, I don't see a, an issue to do that. If, if for some reason I, uh, something is really weird, uh, we could actually make our own profile from uh, Color Pro, iPro and but it is a, it's a little bit of a lengthy program. So, but the profiles work, work great. Make sure you use ice. And you know, if, if you happen to use somebody else's, every, every uh, paper company has IC profiles that'll fit it. If you're sending your stuff to the lab, ask them what, what uh, profiles they're using, let them send it to you. So you can see exactly what you, you know, what, what you're going to be getting. Got it. Um, why did your layers panel only show background layer plus the layer you were working on when your workflow used multiple layers? Because uh, uh, for uh, time constraint, I, I, do, I do save my layers, um, but they can start building up pretty much. Although if you see, I, I can actually go back to my channels, which I have, which, which also builds up your, uh, your, file, your file size. So I can actually go back to my, my channels and once again, I can go back and, and select them and, and work on them. Um, so this, I should have mentioned in the beginning that we did the street photography webinar that maybe over a year ago now. Um, and this question was asked several times, but do you get releases for the individual people you photograph? I'm sorry, do I have a get, uh, model get releases? releases. Mm -hmm. it, uh, my, my first thing I would tell everybody is try to get a model release. Does it always happen? No, because some of the times I'm in, out real quick. If I start to, uh, you know, I also like to uh, converse with my, uh, the people that I photograph, try to understand a little bit about their story. If that happens, I will ask them for a model release. If I can't get a model release, um, what I would normally do is uh, to, uh, give them my card, Give them my email uh, information and say, "Listen, I'd love to send you know, you know some of them out in the street. If they if they're capable of getting an email, I'll send it to them. Uh, and that's not only just people that are out homeless, but and anybody that I photograph. Uh, give them my card. Send me your information. I'll be more than happy to send it to you. And at that point, I will ask them to sign a model release. Got it. All right, you ready for the technical one? Uh oh, okay. <laughs> So this is a bit off topic, but when I learned um, what chemistry black and white, I was a zone system uh, affectionado. I have asked other black and white experts, but no one has a definitive answer. What RGB values would you use to check zone um, five? Is it 210 too close? Uh, first of all, uh, that's a great question, and I and I used to use the zone system way back when. I didn't I didn't work in a dark room, but I used to shoot a, a medium uh, large format cameras, and I used the zone system uh, uh, meter. First of all, one of the things I would suggest you to do is well, five five is five is that's just a neutral setting anywhere you you know you look. So I think they said it, six. I'm sorry. They said uh, zone six. 
Zone six, which is which is just a, a slightly above, you know, the great, you know, 128, which which is fine. That that uh, depending on your subject. Um, but what I would ask you to do is, I don't know if this gentleman prints, but when you're in Photoshop, I would set your curves or your or your levels, uh, your eyedropper tools to to make sure that you're not over you're going over whites or going uh, below blacks. So that's really important. And that, that's the digital way of me taking care of some of these uh, zone system things. If you want, I can show you very quickly. Sure. Okay. I'll, I'm ask, gonna... I'll ask the other questions while you do that. Okay. So um, let, me, let me go into Lightroom. Okay. Uh, so you can still get it even though it was technical? Yeah. Um, I, I, I used to love, I used to love the zone system. Trust me. Uh, okay. So let me open up one of my, one of these images here. So, uh, I'll open up a selection. And you're not sharing your screen yet. I will. Okay. Do you ever use Canon printers? I have, I have a pro 100. It's, it's an older one. I've always found, uh, a, the newer ones are fantastic. And uh, the older ones I, I found just was a little clunky. Um, but since since I had all the, uh, uh, I had a uh, Epson printer from way back when I decided to go that route, but the, you, the Canon printers are pretty, pretty amazing. Let me share my screen. Uh, share screen, share screen. Okay, so can you see that? Yep. Okay. So once again, here you'll, here you'll see some, some different lays here I have, but again, my channels will bring me where I want to go. But I, what I wanted to do is I would, I would ask everybody, especially if you're doing your own printing, uh, let me just take this for instance. Go into layers and set, and set your, your eyedropper values. And what, what I would do is, of course, your your mid-tone should be 128. And that is dead center, as you can see right here. So when you're looking to uh, color adjust, this would be uh, a good tool to get your color balance where it needs to be. Um, once you do that, uh, then, then go into your blacks. Here, I don't, I don't, I haven't gone to zero because you want some detail, although you're going to go into the, some kind of blacks and it's okay, but you don't want no blacks dominating your image. So I usually set it to about 14. So if I'm clicking in an area that's black, I want to tr try to keep it 14 and, and above. Okay. And then lastly, the whites. I don't keep it all the way up to, you know, 255. I bring it down to 245, 245, 245 for the exact same uh, reason. I don't want to, I don't want to start off with an image that is blown out. I, I want to have some kind of detail in there. And then, then you go from there. And once you set that and you hit, okay, it's going to say, do you want to save that as a default? You say yes. And, and you're off to go. Okay. Right. And then we're going to end on this question. Um, okay. Do you use the ABW print option with the Epson printer for better black and white prints? Uh, yeah, they have the advanced black and white uh, feature, which is which is really very nice. Um, I, I've tried them both. I haven't seen much of a difference with good ICC profiles and having your having your a, a decent printer. So I've tried them both and it was hard for me uh, to discern which was better. Um, the, the, the printers have become more advanced with more blacks now. So I think it's taken away that variable of sometimes having these little tints that we, that we had seen years ago. You, you're seeing more pure uh, blacks, uh, blacks than you are, than you have ever before. Great. Well, thank you so much. I will send an email when this is on our YouTube channel. So if you missed something, you can go back to it. I'll also send the link to the sheet photography webinar we did because that was really great too. Um, and we're getting some of the same questions when you did your presentation in the beginning. So oh, I'll send right. that out as well. 
I thank you all. I thank everybody for being here and hopefully uh, I'll see you again. Maybe uh, we'll be talking about something else next time around. Yeah, and let us know if there's something that you want to um, dive deeper into and we can try to schedule that in our in 2022 webinars. Thanks. Thanks, Paige, so much. Thank thanks, you everybody. So much, all right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Bye. Bye. Thank you.